Today we are continuing our Advent series on the scandals of Jesus. And today we consider the scandal of blasphemy. I want to read to you a very powerful passage from the book of John, John 8. I will be, be reading verses 12 through 19 and then 56 through 59. Again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Then the Pharisees said to him, You are testifying on your own behalf. Your testimony is not valid. Jesus answered, Even if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is valid, because I know where I have come from and where I am going. But you do not know where I come from or where I am going. You judge by human standards. I judge no one. Yet even if I do judge, my judgment is valid. For it is not I alone who judge, but I and the Father who sent me. In your law it is written that the testimony of two witnesses is valid. I testify on my own behalf, and the Father who sent me testifies on my behalf. Then they said to him, Where is your father? Jesus answered, You know neither me nor my father. If you knew me... You would also know my father. And then verses 56 to 59. Your ancestor Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. Then they said to him, You are not yet 50 years old and you have seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, before Abraham was, I am. So they picked up stones to throw at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. My brothers and sisters, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, a few years ago, Dan Brown came out with his novel that became a bestseller, The Da Vinci Code. And that was followed up by the movie of the same name starring Tom Hanks. And, and both the novel and the movie are good stories on the kind of the spy thriller genre. And yet Brown did something very interesting with that novel. In the very beginning in the preface he says that, that even though it is a work of fiction, much of the novel is fact. Some of the history and, and whatnot is fact. One of the things that he claims that is a fact in his novel, which in, in fact is not a fact, is that it was not until the Council of Nicaea in 325 that the church began to claim, proclaim or, or make the claim that Jesus is divine, that Jesus is God. And his uh, rationale there was the church was in trouble and needed to kind of shore up its authority. And so it went from claiming that Jesus was simply a teacher or a prophet or a philosopher, someone that you could follow their teaching to actually being God. But of course, this isn't the case from the very, very beginning. And in the passage that you heard me read just a moment ago, even on the very lips of Jesus, we get the claim that he is God. The Pharisees saw that as blasphemy, and well, they should have if Jesus is not who he claimed to be. And they reject his claim because he says they need two witnesses. Jesus has just said, I am the light of the world, and I bring to you life. Now, I've had some teachers who were uh, pretty sure of themselves, but I've never had a teacher who claimed to be the light of the world or the giver of, of life. And so no wonder uh, the Pharisees are, are critical of Jesus. And Jesus' response back is, I do have two witnesses. I am a witness and my father is a witness. And the Jews sneer at him, where is your father? Now, if you saw last week's sermon, you will hear in there their uh, a skepticism of him. He was born under suspicious circumstances. No one exactly sure who his father was. And even here in adulthood, they are still remembering that and holding that against him. And they're essentially saying to him, you can't possibly be the light of the world. You're not even eligible to enter into the, into the temple because no one really knows who your father is. Well, Jesus responds that they don't even know who he is and they don't know who his father is and that is the whole problem. And then a little while later, after a long discussion about Abraham, Jesus uh, seems to claim 
to know Abraham himself when he says to them, Your ancestor Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. And indeed, he saw it and was glad. And they respond back, You're not even 50 years old, and you're claiming that you know Abraham? Now, the time from Abraham to Jesus was about the same time period from from the time of Jesus until now, 2,000 or so years. And so they're saying, uh, is there some way that you could know Abraham 2,000 years ago when you are just 50 years now? And Jesus' response back is stunning. Before Abraham was, I am. Now, you probably catch that if you remember the story of Moses. When Moses is before the burning bush and God is speaking to him out of the burning bush, Moses says, "Oh, who am I supposed to tell? Pharaoh has sent me. What is your name, God? And God's response is, I am. And here Jesus says, before Abraham was, he could have said I was, but he doesn't. Before Abraham was, I am. Jesus is saying, not only have I existed all the way back to Abraham and before But I am pre-existent. I am. Jesus is claiming to be God. You see, it wasn't in the year 325 that the proclamation of Jesus' divinity was first made, but it was made at least uh, right here in this passage at this time. In Deuteronomy 5, when Moses is recounting the the Ten Commandments for the people, he tells them, You shall not make a wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God. And then Moses adds, For the Lord will not acquit... Anyone who misuses his name. Now the highest or the worst way you can possibly misuse the name of the Lord is to claim to be the Lord. And here Jesus has just done that. And so it is no wonder that the Pharisees pick up stones and are prepared to stone him. And yet because it is not yet his time, Jesus is able to hide himself and slip away from them. Jesus has just made the claim that he is God. The Pharisees don't believe it. Presumably, you and I do believe it, and it should make all the difference in the world. Sometimes uh, someone may ask you, do you believe that Jesus is the way to God? And I would hope that we would all answer, absolutely, yes, I believe that Jesus is the way to God. But in a sense, that's the wrong question, isn't it? Because, in fact, Jesus is not merely the way to God. Jesus is God. And when we encounter Jesus, when we know Jesus, we know God. As Jesus himself said to Philip at the Last Supper, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. And yet we need to take at least one more step as we look at this scandal of Jesus. If we are going to believe that Jesus is God, we need to recognize that our belief is not simply something that we come to to agree with intellectually. Ever since the Enlightenment, we have associated faith and belief with our heads, with, with what we can come to believe. But faith, biblically, is actually something you stake your very life on. I believe that it is gravity that is holding me to the floor. And I believe that with my head, but I also believe it in the way that I live my life. If I am climbing a ladder up up onto my roof, I'm going to be very careful because I believe that if I fall off the roof, gravity is going to pull me to the ground very quickly and I'm going to be injured. If I had a ball and I were to toss a ball to you because I've spent my entire life, whether I recognize it or not, experimenting with gravity, I would be able to tell by the weight and the shape and the the feel of the ball just how much force to put it uh, behind it in order to arc it up to you so that it counteracts gravity for a bit. And then as gravity grabs it, it should come back down and drop right into your hand. And I can do that not simply because I intellectually believe in gravity, but because my entire life, I have been using gravity and I understand how it works. Likewise, faith in Jesus is not simply coming to the belief with my head that Jesus is God, but because in a sense I have tested him, I have been using the fact that I have come to know Jesus all my life to trust that he is God. And rather than simply avoiding falling off of roofs or throwing balls, it is a way that I then can and should base everything that I do on. That Jesus indeed is God. There's a wonderful story in the book of Luke 
where uh, a man is crippled and his friends bring him to Jesus. And, and Jesus is inside a house and the house is so full of people they can't get their friend in. And so somehow, and I would love to see this happen, they, they use the ladder that would have been outside the house and they get the man's stretcher up the ladder and onto the flat roof and they dig a huge hole in the thatch of the roof and they lower the man down at Jesus' feet. And Jesus looks at the man and he says to the man, Friend, your sins are forgiven. And the scribes and Pharisees in the house are furious with Jesus because they say only God can forgive sins. And so we see here again an instance of Jesus uh, claiming to be God. His, his response back to them, what's easier to say, your sins are forgiven or take up your mat and walk? But he is making a claim there. But even more importantly, what I want you to know about that story or remember about that story is that before he says your sins are forgiven, Luke tells us, when Jesus saw their faith, he then said, friend, your sins are forgiven. For Jesus, faith was not something that is up here. Faith is something that you can see. You can actually see faith being put into action. And so the scandal of Jesus, the potential blasphemer who actually isn't a blasphemer, is not simply that we come to believe with our heads that Jesus is God, but the scandal is that we live our lives out of that belief. During Advent and Christmas season, we celebrate the scandal that God himself came to live among us. Emmanuel, God with us. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, as John tells us. And we celebrate, as strange and scandalous as it sounds, God died for us. And we celebrate the mystery that through succumbing to death, somehow God conquers death and fulfills what he told those people all those years ago in the passage for this morning. I am the light of the world, and whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Not simply whoever comes to an intellectual belief in me, but whoever follows me. And so, brothers and sisters, let us live our lives because of that truth. A truth that was not uh, the vain grasping at power at a bunch of people who were in a council in the year 325. But rather, the true and life-changing hope that they were proclaiming in that Nicene Creed, in that council, that was already uh, far, far before them. A truth that had already been lived out here on this earth. They recognized, as we recognize, that the hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. Amen. Amen.